you know, in 33 AD, when Jesus was still walking around on the, on the earth, on the planet, there were about 120 followers of Jesus Christ. Not that many, less than 200. Like that, um, this church size, size of this church. Jesus started with 12 disciples that he chose and they multiplied during the three and a half years ministry. And it's about 120 people. Not that many people were following Jesus while he was on this planet Earth. Today, 2,000 years later, there are 2.3 billion followers of Jesus. 2.3 billion Christians. That's one out of every three people here on the planet. What happened? How did some, something grow from a small group of just 12 backwards and the peasants, Jewish fishermen, to the largest organization on the planet Earth. What happened? Now let me just put this perspective. With 2.3 billion members of Christian church, the church is larger than China. The church is larger than China and Europe put together. The church is larger than Europe China and, um, and United States put together. Nothing on this planet comes close to the size of the church. It speaks more languages than the United Nations. It is the biggest organization on the planet. How did it get that big? What's amazing to me is that Jesus never wrote anything down. He never wrote a book, never wrote a letter. But more books have been written about Jesus Christ than any other subject or topics in all of the history of mankind. Jesus never wrote any songs. He never composed any music. And yet, more music has been written about Jesus Christ than any other subject combined, put together. The greatest music over the last 2,000 years is granted to be written by the church in all different styles of music. Jesus never built any buildings, but more architecture has been built in honor of Jesus to glorify him than any other figures or subjects on the planet Earth. I can go on and on and on. Jesus never drew any paintings, pictures. Jesus never built any statues. And yet, more art has been dedicated to the subject of Jesus Christ than anything else in all of the history. A great historian named Pelican from Yale University, this is what he wrote. Take a look at the next screen. He said, regardless of, what any, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible, with some sort of super magnet, to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of its name, how much would be left? Now it is impossible to imagine the world without Jesus Christ. He gave the world its most influential movement. Think about this. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was walking around on the planet, Caesar, the Roman emperor, looked like ruling the world. They thought they eliminated, removed Jesus' teaching and his influence. And it seemed everything about Jesus was done, just over. It's all done. And yet today, 2,000 years later, we give our children a name from the Bible, like John, Peter, Paul, Mark, and Mary, Sarah, Hannah. And we give our dog's name like Caesar and Nero. What on earth happened? Think about this. Jesus never traveled more than about 200 miles from his hometown during his earthly ministry. And yet, 2,000 years later, you can find his followers in every part of the world. How did this Christianity grow so far and so fast from just 12 guys from the backside of the desert to 2.3 billion people all around the world? What's the secret? What made those first Christians so contagious? 
that it spread like wildfire all around the world. What on earth happened? One of the unique aspects of Christianity compared to other faith, communi- other faith communi- community and movements is that it actually traces its origin to one particular event on, in, one, in, in one moment on one day in a history. This is not true for Buddhism, Judaism, or Islam, or Hinduism. It is, the answer is, resurrection on Easter. And it becomes the single most important event in the history. Easter actually changed everything. But at first, when it happened, it was not in the way many people think. Well, From our point of view, 2,000 years later, many people think of Easter as a comforting story, says, spring is coming, flowers are blooming, life is eternal, everything's going to work out. It's a very optimistic, positive message. But the response to the resurrection on the first Easter in the gospel was only fear, concern, anxiety. In fact, people were more afraid after the resurrection than they were before. Now, after Jesus died, they take his body down and they buried him in a tomb. Now, in those days, they didn't bury people in the ground on the dirt. They just threw away or just burned them. But when it comes to an important person, they bury them in caves. And there was a rich man named Joseph Arimathea, who gave his unused tomb in a cave to be used for Jesus. The enemies of Jesus go to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and says, Now, we are afraid, we are very afraid that somebody's going to steal his body. They're going to take, the, take his body. He was a popular man, and there are still his followers who think that the trial and his death was unfair. Well, that makes sense. Fine. So they got the Roman governor to agree to three things. They rolled a giant stone that took multiple men over in front of the tomb's door so that it couldn't be moved by any single person. Then they sealed it with the Roman seal, and so it could not be broken into. And then third, they posted the Roman guards on either side of Uh, the Jesus tomb. Now, where were the 12 disciples doing all of this? They are scared to death. They are not believing. They think it's over. They think their dreams is dead. Their dreams are crushed. They are not expecting him to come back to life. They were in a room and they were weeping and depressed and discouraged in despair. And the Bible says that they lock the door because they are terrified that the same thing that happened to Jesus might happen to them. They were scared to death that the next, the Romans would be coming after them and executing them too. See, the first Christians, no, first disciples, they are not the great men of faith after the crucifixion. They were cowards. They are actually hiding, cowering in fear. And the Jesus movement was generally, actually, literally, really coming to the end. Think about that. Imagine that. What happened without Jesus and the movement is end? But there was a woman, a hero, named Mary Magdalene, was one of the many women who followed Jesus with the disciples. She decides to go to the tomb on Easter morning. I don't know if she's going to take a, a flower or what. She goes up to the tomb, and when she gets there, she is shocked. Because the seal has been broken, the stone has been rolled away, and the guards are gone. She walks into the tomb, and she sees the bedding and the clothes that has been wrapped around Jesus are there very neatly. And Jesus' body isn't there. Well, I've seen a lot of people and some people who don't believe the resurrection really happened, saying the resurrection is a lie and fake. 
they claim that the tomb was empty because somebody has stolen the body of Jesus. But listen, let me give you another advice. When you steal a dead body, leave the clothes on it, right? You don't want to take a naked dead body, particularly in the shape of Jesus at the time. And then Mary hears a word. Somebody says, Mary, Mary. And she turns around and there's living Jesus. And they had a conversation. Oh no, I'm very much alike. I kept my promise. Three days later, I'll come back to life. Go tell my brothers and sisters that I am back. Mary goes running down the secret hiding place with the 12 disciples in fear. And she breaks in and says, He's back. The tomb is empty. And they said, Mary, are you insane? Are you crazy? None of them believe it. None of them. And now, I want to show you a video. Let us watch a video clip. What's happening in the room with the 12 disciples? Take a look. Peter! Peter! Everyone! The tomb is open. He's alive. I saw him. That's not possible. I saw him. Mary, maybe it was someone else. You think I'm mad? Peter, see the tomb for yourself. Stop doubting. Now, let me ask you, if you just bury somebody and they showed up in the dinner a few days, three days later, how would you feel about that? Very confused and or terrified. Maybe doubt. Am I seeing this? Are you kidding me? Of course, you would be full of doubt uh, with a little bit of fear. But if they came over and give you a hug and they start talking with you and had dinner with you, you might get a little excited. It would certainly change your worldview. And the change in the disciples can only be explained by the resurrection. Because 
they were depressed in fear and discouragement. And instantly, the disciples' attitude changed. All of a sudden, they are courageously confident and they are contagiously joyful and continuously hopeful because they've been witnessed a resurrected Jesus. The first hand, they saw it and they are not afraid anymore. Now they are ready to take on the world, and they did. And within 300 years, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. And Christianity so rapidly spread all over the world. What happened? The resurrection happened. And there were people who experienced resurrected Jesus. They are eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Most people have no idea how many people saw Jesus over the next 40 days. Take a look at the next screen. Yes, 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 16. It says, When we told you about the powerful coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were not telling made-up stories that someone invented. Rather, we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. The strongest form of testimony in the court of law is the eyewitnesses. When somebody says, I saw it, I was there, then it's very hard to refuse. But not just one person. Dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the book of Acts chapter 1. Take a look at the next screen. For 40 days after his death, Jesus appeared to people many times in many ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. One of the reasons why Christianity grew so rapidly was because so many people had seen Jesus. He walked around in Jerusalem for 40 more days. Take a look at the next screen. It's from the first Corinthians. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and then he was raised from the dead on the third day. He was seen by Peter and then by 12 disciples. After that, he was seen by more than 500, 500 of his followers at one time, most of, uh, most of whom are still alive, though some have died by now. Last of all, I saw him too. Friend, this is what is called conclusive proof, indisputable, definitive evidence. It's like this. Now, if I were to tell you, maybe you're not going to believe this. Actually, yesterday, as I was walking down the street in Savannah downtown, actually by Manis, I saw Elvis Presley. <laughs> maybe you're going to say, hey, he's kidding me, Sejun. Elvis Presley, you didn't see him. He's dead. Even if he came alive, he doesn't come to Savannah. <laughs> but if... 500 other residents of Savannah say, Oh, yes, I saw him too. I saw him. He was around in Savannah for more than 40 days. We had dinner with him at Manis. I went hunting with him. I went fishing with him. I saw him standing in line to check out stuff in, at Sullivan or Shopco. We saw him walking with his dog over Mississippi River. With five hundreds of eyewitnesses, you must believe me now, right? These guys are no longer afraid. Christianity spread from 12 to 2.3 billion people because there were multiple eyewitnesses and they were willing to die for it because they've seen that really happen. Not just that. Once they meet the resurrected Jesus Christ, they didn't live with their own powers. They didn't live with their own powers anymore. They realized, I am vulnerable. I need somebody who is much more powerful than me. I cannot live with my own power. They are empowered by God's Spirit, and then they are so contagious. Jesus promised this, before he was ascended to heaven. Take a look at the next screen. It's from the, the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power to testify about me with great effect to the people in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the 
ends of the earth about my death and my resurrection. And it was so true, and they did it. Now here's a cool thing about the resurrection. God never intended for you to go all through your life on your own power. He want to put his power inside you through the Holy Spirit. The power that God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead is available to you on a daily basis. When he puts his spirit into your life, this is another promise you have. Take a look at the next screen. From the book of Ephesians, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. It is the same mighty power, same mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. What is the power of the resurrection that's available to you? It is the power to change. It is power to keep going when you feel like giving up. It is power to face problems and conquer the problems or to break your bad habits. It is the power to keep on overcoming. It is the power to heal your relationship, your marriage. Power to transform your finances. It is power to achieve your dreams and God's dreams. It is God's power that is available to anyone who is willing to accept the power of resurrection and yield to the power of Holy Spirit in their life. That's an amazing thing. And that's why Christianity spreads so fast they would do it in, they wouldn't do it in their own powers. They experienced the power and movement of the Holy Spirit. They raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and the greatest miracle really happened. What changed their worldview virtually overnight? How can you explain the birth of the church? Why did Christianity emerge and spread all throughout the world so rapidly? And all of the cowards who betrayed Jesus and ran away, now turn to people who boldly, courageously gave their lives for him and their belief even to death. I think there is only one answer we can think of. And I believe you need to agree with this. And now here we are 2,000 years later. We haven't seen resurrected Jesus, no eyewitnesses. But we still follow him. And I remember what Jesus said to his disciples in the room on Easter morning. Take a look at the next screen. Because you see me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen me and have believed. I'm so glad that Jesus said it because we believe him without seeing him. We are more blessed, and then we are Easter people. Friends, we are Easter people. It is your decision to make, to live an Easter person with infinite hope and courage and the transforming and redeeming power of resurrection and go out to change the world to, to, to the better place to live like the first Christians did. Or you make a decision to live a skeptical and cynical person to find ways to ignore strong evidence of resurrection. We continue to hold the faith, the power of resurrection, that someday he will establish justice and suffering, break poverty, heal the broken, and redeem creation, and bring the righteous dead to life. In anything in this, in this sorry, dark world, it is worthy of salvation. It is Jesus Christ indeed risen and that we have eternal hope because you are all Easter people. May God bless you all Easter people. Amen.